So we've come to the last fireside chat of today. And luckily I am I'm able to, to invite a man to the stage and I actually have matching shoes with him. And his name is Lee Chambers from Mill Allies UK. You can sit over there. And my dear friend Drew Billy Moria. Now the co-founder of Canvas 2030, but we met literally 2006, 2007, I think, when I was busy with my Interactive Children's Museum and you were busy with um, Aflatoon. So our conversation is going to be about the power of allyship, and I think we've heard the word ally a lot huh, today. So Lee, I'm going to ask the question to you before, because when we had our pre-talk uh, last week, but also, you know, in the breakout room. I mean, you were telling me about how you felt that a lot of the things that you have been able to actually achieve, it's because you were able to create those allyships. Would you like to be able to share a little bit more with the audience also about who you are and explain a little bit also who your role models are? Yeah, thank you, Kareen. So, for me, I do a lot of work in the gender equity space. I'm very much focused on how we can ensure that men are actively engaged in driving gender equity forward, partnering with women to accelerate the process and understand the part and role that they can play in ensuring that we create a more inclusive and equitable world. A lot of my work is within business, but also in education. And, you know, my kind of entry point into this was quite interesting. Uh, I'd built a tech company, then got ill and had to learn to walk again. That stripped away some of my masculinity and made me start to think about what leadership could be rather than what I was told it could be. Then I spent three and a half years as a stay-at-home father to my two children. I was able to see life from a different perspective and finally able to listen to women and understand lots of the challenges that they had that I just hadn't seen as a man living in the UK. Uh, from a role model perspective, Kareen, I've always looked up to the group of men who were behind the women who drove for women to get the right to vote in England. And they are, you know, there was a number of different men. Uh, there was Frederick Lawrence, there was Henry Nevison, Henry Fawcett. But what they did is they used their privilege and power as men to get women into the right places, into the media, into the political discussions where they weren't invited. They gave up their space at the table and ultimately were professional troublemakers to ensure that they were able to create that process. So both my other idols are David Smith and Brad Johnson, who were the first people to really focus on how much of a win-win is for men when men get involved in gender equity and really start to hone the skills of allyship to be able to partner and actually understand when to step forward and make change, and when to step back, get the hell out of the way, and get, give the space to women like historically hasn't happened. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Jeru, yes, thank you also for accepting the invitation to be part of this today. It's really, really important. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So, Jeru, we've known each other for quite some time. You are a change maker. You like to go, I mean, I know you are passionate about educating children about money, how to, you know, you even involved our current queen. She was the princess at that time, I remember. But could you tell me a little bit more about, you know, you're now the co-founder of Catalyst 2030. Maybe share with the audience what that is. Uh, what is your mission with that? And how is allyship actually being woven in to Catalyst 2030? Thanks. Um, so Catalyst 2030 is a network of social innovators and entrepreneurs across the world. So the first thing I do is give you all an invitation to join Catalyst 2030. What does Catalyst 2030 believe in? It's that alone you can make so much change. But as was said earlier, if we have our collective power, we can really accelerate change. So Catalyst 2030 started, it's a recent movement, it started four years back. And what we've been able to do is really give a voice to social innovators. A, to change how funding works, because honestly that's the biggest obstacle, especially for us at women. I'm not going into all the statistics that have happened. B, is to prove that we can work collaboratively 
And if we work collaboratively, we can do a lot. There's a lot of talk on climate and what through Catalyst 2030 South-South Climate Alliance we are doing is we are actually telling COP, please create a vertical on social innovation so that we as biz social innovators actually get a seat at the table because just now COP is pretty dominated by business. And we don't have our voice. We are nice token people everywhere. But if we work collectively, and everyone who's working in the climate space, that means all of you, join us in creating a social innovation vertical at COP. And the last thing that Catalyst 2030 does is says, we all need to change. We all need to move away from the I to the we. Because we do it together, we can bring about change together, and we can actually hopefully achieve the SDGs, and if not SDGs, then later. And that's the power of allyship which you talked about, working together, co-creating. And um, I understand you have about 3,000 organizations already who have yes. joined. Mine is actually one of them. Yes. 4,500 individuals. Do you know what is the percentage men and women? Do you have Equal. Ideas? Equal. Yeah, it varies with every group, but it's between 49 to 51. So yes, and that's been a very, very, very conscious choice. Even in our board, we have two main principles. One is gender equity, and other is racial equity. So every one of our working groups, right from our governing council to our collaborations, we always ensure this equity. Fantastic. And we have actually more women in leadership, I'm happy to say. Sorry? More women in leadership, I'm happy to say. Okay, wonderful. So, Lee, can you maybe go back to a point in time in history, or at least in your working career, when you felt that being a man was in your advantage? Or when you felt that the male focus that you had was maybe something that had to be subservient to the people that you were working with? Yeah, so I suppose I've got an interesting perspective of being allied to from a racial perspective as a, as, a, as a black man. And I think that sometimes, for me when I was younger, the discrimination I faced from a racial perspective stopped me from seeing how privileged I was from a gender perspective. And it wasn't until I went into the workplace and started to just see how male normative workplaces are. Almost everything in the workplace has been designed for men by men. And the truth is, until you take a step out and realize how that's actually built, you just don't see it because for you, it's your default. And it actually took me getting ill and stepping out of my business to actually be able to start listening to other people's perspectives. And it wasn't until I became a primary caregiver for my children that I saw just how caregiving wasn't valued, but also, you know, being the only father in that room is a really powerful experience. And you know, being able to kind of leverage that experience and actually go back into the workplace and start to get other men to be able to see the things that they don't see. Because if I'm brutally honest, I didn't see a lot of the gender inequity around me until I started to notice a few things. And then I started to notice more. And then I started to not be able to unsee those things. And all of a sudden, you become quite uncomfortable just like it must be for women every single day. Uh, so that kind of, I suppose, started to get me to enact, why are other men not seeing this? And the truth is, quite often, you don't know what you don't know. But you have to start that journey somewhere. Because for me, that journey has done a lot of things for me. It's made me more patient and present with myself. It's enhanced my own self-awareness. It's also made me able to communicate more effectively and lead a diverse team understanding other people's perspectives and bringing those diverse ideas forward to prototype, to make products, services, and the things that we do an awful lot better. And I can see how, from a planetary perspective, some of, the, some of the women that I've worked with over the years, if they have been funded properly, the world would be different today. The impact they've made with the lack of resource, if they were resourced properly, where would we be? We'd be a lot further ahead. So now really is the time, and I think it's a beautiful room to be in today, because what does allyship mean and where did the word come from? It comes from old French. It means to unite, to combine, and to come together. And I feel that's exactly how we're going to make change right now. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yes, I would like to have a little applause for that.
And I think this is also something that you are really standing for, you know? I mean, you've had a beautiful journey, and I mean, and it must not have always been easy to live in the Netherlands, I know, because I come from there, and I know some of the challenges that you have been battling, and it's, especially when it comes to gender equality, we're really moving very, very slow. But um, can you maybe also talk a little bit about the successes that you've had in your life? Well, the glass is always half full and half empty, you know. So living in the Netherlands as a woman, I'm just going to say it, as a woman of color, in my children's school, uh, despite being on the top NL list of whatever powerful woman, they always used to say, so will you come and clean in our house? Will you be a cook? So it was a very nice experience having that on a regular basis. And I still face it because I live in a relatively okay neighborhood and when I'm at the train station, women will approach me to come and clean at them. So that's a day-to-day -day occurrence for I me apologize. in the Netherlands. No, it's fine. But I think it's important to share that because it gives me a fantastic uh, advantage because now I understand problems for two sides. And that's why I say the glass can either be half full or half empty. And I think you can either look at the negatives and bog you down or you can say, oh, that's just fantastic. That's a learning experience. And that's what I did. Because it helped me to see a perspective I would never have seen if I was living in India. So I'm really, really very grateful for it. And then I started looking at the positives where I could find other situations. And it gave me a lot more empathy. So I'm really, really, really helpful. And then when you meet people who are helping you along the way, it it makes you more grateful and it makes you uh, really realize that the world is a family and the family has the good, the bad and the ugly and you start taking it in that way. So for me, living in the Netherlands made me realize Vasudeva Kutumba, the world is a family, let's all to come together and bring about the change. And that's what I've been doing much, much more. Thank you. So we are unfortunately reaching the end of our fireside chat because of the time constraints. But Lee, what would you like the audience to leave with? And what would you like them to remember about you and any lessons? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's, there's so much that could be said on this topic. Uh, what I will say is that I am, I am naively optimistic by nature. And I think that helps with the work that I do, trying to get so many men to switch their perspective but what I will say is, if we think about the skills of allyship, they align very closely to the skills of leadership. And actually, those leadership traits are becoming more and more important and more and more valuable for the future. There's a lovely tangent with that, in that the next generation are not willing to be led in the way that people have been led before. And that's really powerful because they are also a catalyst for change. They are looking to be led empathetically, compassionately, by people who can communicate, by people who fundamentally will listen, and in a technologically advancing and uncertain and volatile world, it's actually these skills that will give us the stability to thrive. And so much of that comes when we actively partner together. But fundamentally, women have already blazed those trails. A lot of men just need to catch up. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my message for everyone. Thank you. Jiru, what, what, what would you like to end this talk with? The world is a family. So let's all of us think of everyone as family, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of everything. And I think we as women, if we go shoulder to shoulder, we can really see the change we want to see. So I would say let's join forces with our collective power and through our collective power be the change that we wish to see. That's what I will say. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I think we've come to the end of this inspiring session. I think Women for Change. And if you have time, go and walk along the 25. Oh, you would like to have no, a picture? No, OK. No, no, I was saying we should thank you oh. for having such a fantastically facilitated oh, thank, thank you, Karine. So let's agree thank to you, Karine. <laughs> well, this is what, what I like to do. Very much. But anyway, if you have time, walk over there for the 25 women who are, you know, which I like that you said, Garance, that they're not all known. Some of them are actually very known, but not all of them. 
and I think it'll help us amplify the work that we're doing because we are doing it for you, we're doing it for my son, and we're doing it for all of your children and grandchildren. And I want to congratulate Garance with Change Now, but with this amazing initiative.